Hello, so I'm Jodie Azhar and I'm the lead technical artist on the Total War series at Creative Assembly, but I am also passionate about diversity and that includes diversity in the games I play, in the games I make and in the teams I work with as a facilitator for the first two. So diversity is a term that we're hearing a lot at the minute. Um, people want more diversity, companies want more diversity, that's not just in games, that's in all businesses. But what is diversity? So diversity is a range of different things and the state of being diverse. And diverse is showing a great deal of variety or very different. And that's not just people. Um, here is a diverse range of fruit and vegetables which allows us to make lots of tasty meals and we see diversity through representation. Here is a representation of some tasty fruit and vegetable. And a word that we also hear with diversity is inclusion and these get bundled together often but they're actually two separate terms that have different meanings. So inclusion is the act or state of including or of being included within a group or structure and we can't achieve diversity without inclusion. So there's a lovely quote by Werner Myers, which is, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. So it's all well and good us wanting diversity, but without us including people and welcoming them in, we're not gonna really get anywhere. So along with diversity, there are nine characteristics that are protected. And this means that you are protected from being discriminated um, by these uh, characteristics in work, in education, when buying or renting a property, uh, when you are a guest or member of a private club. Um, everyone in this room uh, is affected by at least five of these characteristics. So you all have an age, you were born, you're here. Um, you have a race, uh, you have a religion or you don't. Uh, you have a sex, and I put gender in brackets here because sex is the term that's officially uh, protected against. Uh, it, it's the classification that's protected, but um, we all have a gender identity that may or no, may not be uh, connected with our sex, and we have sexual orientation. So we are affected by these characteristics, and they may be positive discrimination or negative discrimination. So let's start looking at some figures. So as a disclosure, uh, the statistics here are gathered from a range of sources on the internet, but when we're working with large sets of human data, um, those statistics and numbers can vary. So the data that I've gathered is, may differ slightly from reality, but I've tried to find the most recent, accurate and usable numbers without any kind of agenda or representing any specific idea. So we'll start relating this to games. We have an estimated 32.4 million people in the UK that play games. And we have roughly 50-50 split between people who identify as male and female. So that's about 16.2 million men, 16.2 million women playing. We also have 12.9% of the UK is non-white or non-white British. So that's roughly 4.18 million non-white game players. So what do we actually know about the people who are playing games? A recent uh, survey by Nesta uh, estimates the average age of someone playing games at 43 which is a raise from 35 that was found in a separate survey back in 2013. They actually find men and women are equally likely to play video games. Um, men play more frequently, but actually if you're a woman, you're more likely to play games overall. Those who play games uh, tend to be more educated and they also tend to be involved with other cultural activities. They're more likely to read, more likely to paint, go and visit, national heritage sites, go to the library. And the market is changing. This is a very different view from our stereotypical teenage white boy sitting in his bedroom. And let's take a look at the industry that we work in. So there's nearly two million people employed in the UK in creative industries. So that includes games, but also film, uh, television, and around 37% of those in creative industries are female. 
So a bit off of the 50-50% split in gender. But then we look at specifically at tech, we're only 17% female employment. And in games, we're currently around 15%. Um, that tends to fluctuate every year, but that's quite a, quite a way off our 50-50% our, our split um, in gender population distribution. Also around 11% in creative industries are black, Asian, minority or ethnic. That's actually quite close to 12.9% non-white British. But we can't actually find, or I couldn't find, any good usable numbers for representation in games or tech for ethnic representation, which may or may not indicate an issue. So why should people like you care? Well, I like playing video games and having diverse people brings new ideas and culture to video games. Different people have different experiences, you have different stories that you've been told, you have a different story to tell, you have different rituals, different ways of life. When you bring a diverse group of people together, the new ideas challenge those people who are already in a group. So if you're a group of developers, you've already got your own ideas, if we introduce other people, uh, to the mix who have their own ideas, then suddenly you're inspired by the new ideas or you're challenged. So the people already at the table are coming up with new ideas and being more innovative. Along with that, we have the opportunity to grow and learn. Again, being challenged gives us new ideas and allows us as individuals to grow because things feel more fresh. Uh, we're more inspired and having others around us who support a culture of innovation and enable change, make things a lot easier for us to take features and projects in a new exciting direction. And it also makes people feel valued and not overlooked when you feel that you're being supported by these other people. And companies also want to make their product stand out. So to illustrate that point, I've got a few graphics. Does anyone know what game this is? This is Marine Sharpshooter 3. How about this? That's Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. <laughs> Counter-Strike Global Offensive, see, few, few people know. Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And Battlefield 4. So a few people know some of these titles, if not all, and you're just being a bit quiet. You might be able to tell from the UI, maybe some of the settings, but for me, I'm, I'm not a big shooter player, but also I look at this. If I saw any of those in, in an advert, I'd have no idea what game those are. To me, they don't stand out. Uh, there's not a lot of diversity, and they may be amazing for the people who play it, but games want to find their unique selling point. So how do games affect people? How do the games we're actually playing? So, they're part of media consumption, the same as film, books, television. They influence and inform us on how to make decisions. Um, and we have a responsibility to realize that even if we don't react to it. It affects the way we think and our expectations in life. Um, young people learn about growing up from stories, from films, from what they read in magazines, from TV you learn how to fall in love, what to expect, how to deal with heartbreak, how to deal with all these situations, and games feed into that. It also influences how we interact with each other. So when you meet an NPC in a game, the script that someone's written, that's an interaction with another person that might not be a real person, but that's, that's a new, new character that you're gaining information from. But it also might be people in real life. If you're playing a multiplayer game, then there are other human people on the end of that. So we need to protect people from toxic behavior and make sure that they're having a good experience. It also changes our perspective and, and our acceptance of each other and different things. It also changes the way that we deal with ourselves. Games can be a retreat for people they can give us therapy or a time to reflect, and different games give us different emotional responses. 
They can also be part of our education. That can be knowledge education as well as our emotional education. And they provide role models. So I don't know if any of you here have a hero in a game that you thought, they're really amazing, I wish I could be like them, or they've inspired you. And to illustrate how important role models are, um, is this lovely tweet by um, an American Muslim activist uh, who asked his five-year-old son, do you want to be president when you grow up? And his son says, no, dad. Dad says, why not? Kid's like, come on, dad, you know why? Dad's like, no, I don't, tell me. The son's like, because dad. Everyone knows only black people can be president. And there's been one black president in the history of the United States, but to a five-year-old, that's their view of who a president is. So what we show people, young people, even adults, it's all information that they're taking and processing. So how do we go about tackling this issue? So the games that we make, are we providing positive experiences? The teams that make them, are they diverse? Are they able to represent different scenarios, different stories, different ideas and present them to the audience? In art, in the characters, do we have diverse characters? Do we have diversity of environment? All the visual information on screen. In our interfaces, and this could be the, how we're interfacing through advertisements, how are we selling our games? Are we making them appeal to a range of different people? Or are we isolating people? Even the terms hardcore and casual gamers, is that more decisive or welcoming? Um, and also our, our UIs, are they familiar? Are they accessible to people? Are they able to be interacted with by people with disabilities? And also our peripherals and how we expect input into our games. And also in the mechanics, what makes games exciting is that they are interactive and different mechanics can appeal to wide varieties of, of audiences and are there a range of games with different mechanics that appeal to different people? So earlier I covered some statistics in about the UK population but we make games which sell to a global market. So we don't want to isolate and just go, these are the people living near me. We, we want to sell to everyone across the world. So we want to make games that appeal to those people. So still globally, we're looking at roughly 50-50 split on male and female. Uh, globally, it's slightly more male, um, which might be down to uh, male child, um, uh, Asian, um, forgotten the word. Um, but yeah, promoting male child po policies. There we go. Um, but yeah, 57 to 60% of the population is Asian. 18 to 20% alone of the global population is Chinese. Then if 18% is Indian and around 60, six, around 6% 6 Arab. And we've also got around 15% African. And what does this mean overall? White Caucasian is not the majority. So if you're making a game where players can pick their character, what their character looks like, white shouldn't be the default. In fact, if your game allows to pick gender, you shouldn't force a default at all if possible and allow the player to choose. Allow players to have options of skin tone. Don't even define uh, nationalities or ethnicity because even those can limit. Give players the options to be the characters that they want. And looking at disabilities, um, not all disabilities are visible. 18% of working adults have a disability. This can include something like visual impairment. So with high definition 4K monitors where we're outputting beautiful resolutions, that tiny text alienates people who find it difficult to read. You've, so you've got your sofa maybe two meters away from your TV, suddenly you have to pull it right in to actually read what anyone's saying on screen or, or the instructions of how to play. Color blindness affects 4.5% of the population, but how many of us when we're designing games are, are thinking about that and thinking about our color choices? Autism, parents of children with autism can often engage with their children through games. Games can 
also be a safe space for people with autism to engage and learn how to interact with other people. So making your games too busy, um, too bright or too loud can be off-putting. And also in the workplace, are, is, your, is your office a safe space for people with autism to feel relaxed? And motion sensitivity is a big one, um, especially with VR becoming popular. Uh, there are a lot of people who are affected by motion sickness, um, but not just when in VR experiences, uh, if you have a game that has a uh, camera shake um, or you, it is a shooter game and things are happening all around, there are certain things that you can do to accommodate and reduce motion sickness for those with motion sensitivity. And how can we improve our studio culture? Well, we can question our ideas. Uh, that's our own ideas of, of what games should be, what mechanics should play like, and also question other people around us. Is it just given that this is the way that games are made, how games work, how this particular game plays? Or maybe we can think outside the box. Uh, supporting each other. So when you have people in the team who are coming up with these new ideas, not just dismissing them, but being an ally. Um, also, our hiring practices. Are we being welcoming when we interview people? Are we displaying the diversity on our teams? Or are we finding that actually it is just white men in an interview room? The language we use when we put up job adverts, are we accidentally using a lot of male pronouns or language that is off-putting to certain ethnicities or minorities or gender? And reaching out. We can't just say we're being diverse and expect people to come to us. We need to make sure that people feel welcome and that we are telling them that they, they can come to the table. Um, one of the great things at Creative Assembly was we recently partnered with the, least, the East London uh, <coughs> Arts and Music College um, because there is a, a lack of new talent and in years to come we are going to find it difficult to hire people so we looked at where we can provide education and we helped Elam come up with this new game design course in an area that is reaching out to people who might not necessarily be considering a career in games. So we're hoping to stop uh, the shortfall by bringing in people, new people, fresh people who wouldn't consider a career in games. And providing role models. We can provide role models in the industry. How are we displaying ourselves on company websites? For certain people, if you look at the breakdown of a team and there are no people of ethnicity or there are no women on a the team, they're going to be put off uh, for applying to your team because they're going to question, are they welcome? Is there a reason that other women, other minority groups, other ethnicities aren't already working at this place? And also speakers. So who are you sending out to talk? Um, after the, the most recent E3, um, one newspaper put together an article that tried to apply uh, the Betchel uh, test to the speakers on stage. Do we have diverse speakers? Are we representing the products that we make and the teams who are making them by putting people on stage who are representative of that? Or is it just the guy who's really confident who says, hey, I can do this. OK, we'll, we'll put him in. And showing support for those people who may be minority or they may be a majority that just aren't coming to the table yet. And we need to listen. If you're not part of a group that you're trying to represent in a game or in your team, you can't expect to know how they want to be seen. And if they're trying to be heard, we need to listen to what they want and how they want to be represented. And we need to invite those people to the table. We need to enable people to design the games that they want and to make those games. And we need to help people tell their stories. Some people can't. There's, there's so many interesting, exciting stories out there, and it might be the story of old people. It could be the story of mothers, people who aren't able or want to make those games. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be telling those stories and allowing players to experience different ways of life, different thoughts, being different people and empathizing with them. And again, how do people want to be seen in games? It's no 
it's no good if we have, hey, we've got ethnic minorities, but actually we've just stereotyped them into the same old things. So they don't feel represented and we're still not fixing the solution. We're, we're kind of just masking over it by going, hey, look, we've represented all these people, but really it's just the same character, but with different skins. So we need to take action. There's a thing called the bystander effect where when there's a lot of people, we as individuals don't feel the need to react because we think, somebody else will do it. And this happens a lot. And you find with some minority groups when they're actually a lot smaller than say something like gender, where it's, it's quite easy to go, well, there's 50% of the population here that aren't coming to the table. That's an easy one to tackle. When you have smaller groups, a lot of the time they're more active because they know that they don't have other people to rely on. And we as individuals shouldn't be bystanders either. If not me, who? if not now, when? Which is a quote from Emma Watson at the UN summit talking about women in STEM. If you don't do anything, how are you expecting other people to? And why do you expect anything to change if you're not willing to be part of that change? So again, be the change that you want to see. Don't rely on others and encourage others to take up the cause. So in summary, why I want diversity and why I want to tackle the known issues with diversity is that it leads to innovation. I want to see in more innovative games and I want there to be more exciting games for me to play um, and also for other people to play so I can discuss them, share experiences and just have more fun and more stories to engage with. And it creates a variety of content so I can get all those stories that I can't think of. I mean, all the stories that I can think of, I, could, I can make those games already, but I, wanna, I want other people to be sharing theirs and for me to be engaged and, and, and challenged. And it pushes quality. When you have other people, they push you in a direction. So I can be a better game diver developer by having other people around me who are diverse and are pushing their ideas. And hopefully I'm coming up with new ideas because they're around me. And it's the right thing to do. How would you feel if just a little part of who you are, something that you can't even control, discriminates you from being part of the gaming culture or being a game developer? So raising those people up and bringing them to the table and welcoming them, it, that's the right thing to do. And for those of you who, are, who want to see this diversity, it is challenging, it is tiring because you have to explain to people why, why is it important? I mean, we're making games already. Like, we're, we're already doing this fun job and if people want to make games, they're welcome to come. Well, f for those of us who are feeling a little bit tired, <laughs> diversity, diversity challenges uniformity and makes diversity easier. The more diverse the teams are, the more it breaks down those uniform teams of stereotypical game developers and makes our industry more diverse. And a little bit of marketing. Um, I work at Creative Assembly and I'm very honored to say that we do have a diversity group because we are invested in having diverse teams working on our games and encouraging diversity within the whole industry. So it is a great place to work with lots of different people. We have 34 different nationalities currently represented um, and we're very pro-diversity and good games. So, thank you very much. <laughs>